Academic Affairs at the Gallatin School at NYU. And of course, Albert Gallatin was the fourth Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, she is widely published with academic essays placed in the Harvard University Press and the University of Pennsylvania Press, peer-reviewed journals like the Journal in American History, a contributing editor to studies in working class history in the Americas, and she's written for The Nation, The New Labor Forum, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, and many other outlets. Her first book was Invisible Hands, The Making of the New Deal, excuse me, The Making of the Conservative Movement from the New Deal to Reagan. Now today she's going to discuss her latest book, uh, Fear City, about the 1970s fiscal crisis. Uh, the book was a finalist for the 2018 Pulitzer Prize in History, and I know why. It is so well-deserved, wonderfully written, uh, richly footnoted. In fact, 1,150 footnotes demonstrating the depth of scholarship. And even though we know the outcome of what's going to happen with New York City, the book is still a page-turner, and I know that because I read it all weekend and thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I did notice in the acknowledgments uh, that um, Kim mentions Professor Richard Silla, who is our board chair, and thanks him for some unpublished work that he did on the crisis. Uh, Dick is currently having some knee surgery and can't attend today, uh, but he certainly sends along his regards. Now, one of the things I want to do is just context the magnitude of what we're talking about. And Cranes recently published just for today the amount of jobs the government uh, has here in New York City. So if you combine the teachers, the housing, the sanitations, the park service, the New York Police Department, the New York Fire Department, New York City Health and Hospitals, and if you want to even throw in the MTA, you would have the third largest employer in the United States. So bigger than McDonald's, bigger than Starbucks, of course, not bigger than Walmart uh, or Amazon. But that underscores how huge uh, the New York City uh, government is. And here to discuss it will be Kim. The book will be on sale afterwards. She would be happy to autograph it. It's my pleasure to introduce Kim Phillips Fine. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me here today and for that extremely generous introduction. And thanks also to Kristen for all the uh, arrangements for today's event. So I'm going to speak um, about the, the crisis and, and try not to go on too long to leave some time for questions and time for people to get back after lunch. So this headline, Ford to City Drop Dead, sums up what most people know about the fiscal crisis of 1975. It's being held up here by Mayor Abe Beam, who was the mayor for most of, for kind of the, the heart of the crisis years. And uh, the speech that President Ford gave, the speech that it refers to on October 29, 1975, at a lunch at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. Ford's position was that the city had brought its, at that point, well publicized fiscal problems on itself and that the federal government had no obligation to help, even though most people believed that New York was about to go bankrupt. Promising to veto any legislation that uh, provided federal aid, and there were several bills circulating through Congress that would have done exactly this, he criticized the city's network of municipal hospitals and its free public university as unnecessary extravagances and luxuries. Why, he asked, should other Americans support advantages in New York that they have not been able to afford for their own communities. And Ford made it clear that he saw the problems of the city as closely connected to those facing the country as a whole. If we go on spending more than we have, he said, providing more benefits and more services than we can pay for, then a day of reckoning will come to New York, to Washington and the whole country, just as it has to New York. And when that day comes, he concluded, who will bail out the United States of America? Now, Ford never actually said the words drop dead in his speech, and he was very upset, in fact, by the negative reaction that his talk received in the city, and even, somewhat implausibly, a little surprised by it. But although he didn't use the actual phrase, his meaning was clear. At this point, in the fall of 1975, the Ford administration was willing to let New York go bankrupt in order to prove a larger point about the dangers of government spending. Now, in the end, New York did not actually default. About a month after this speech, Ford reversed himself and agreed to support a package of short-term loans for the city, but he did so at a high cost for New York. 
the city had to impose a set of extremely steep budget cuts, which ultimately shrunk public sector employment by almost one quarter over the following five years. And in those cuts, uh, three of the city's 19 public hospitals were closed, as were a range of primary health centers, child health centers, drug treatment programs, and immunization clinics. Of its network of, at that point, several hundred daycares for low-income families, 77 lost their funding. The city raised transit fares and inaugurated a long series of fare hikes, breaking with a long commitment to keeping the fare low. The police department lost about 20% of its employees, fire department 10%, board of ed 14%, school staffs were slashed, uh, teachers with less seniority, including many African American and Latino teachers, lost their jobs, school crossing guards were fired throughout the city, and class sizes went up to, in some cases, 45 or 50 kids per class. And the city imposed tuition worth about $1,700 in today's a semester in today's dollars at the, uh, at the City University of New York, breaking a tradition of more than a century of free higher education. People have long debated the precise impact of these cuts on the city, but it is worth noting that they took place in the midst of a crime wave when the homicide rate was rising, a spread of fire in neighborhoods like Bushwick and Brooklyn that has been likened to an epidemic, and the adjustment, more generally, of the city to a post-industrial economy. The poverty rate in New York climbed from about 14% in the late 60s to a little over 20% in the early 1980s, which is roughly where it still is today. In, in short, this was an atmosphere of intense social need, which only made the experience of the cuts more shocking. So my talk today will be about the history of the fiscal crisis and suggesting some of the resonances that this history has for us now. In an era that has seen a resurgence both of municipal bankruptcies, as in Detroit a few years ago, national fiscal crises, as in Greece, and of course, most recently and dramatically, in Puerto Rico, um, exacerbated in, by, the, by Hurricane Maria a little more than a year ago. Many interpretations of the fiscal crisis have argued that these cuts were necessary, inevitable, and that there was no choice, that people essentially accepted them because they understood they was, that was what needed to be done. And also, I think this reflects an underlying assumption that the programs that were cut did not really matter. They were wasteful and not the kind of thing a city government should be doing anyway. So in Fear City, I try to take on these common ideas. And I argue that New York in the mid-20th century, while still a very unequal city in many ways, represented a different way of thinking about social policy and that it contains some programs and ideas that we can learn a lot from now. I suggest that the fiscal crisis did not have to play out as it did, that the way that it unfolded ref reflected a struggle over the future of the city and a kind of challenge to the idea of social citizenship that had prevailed in the mid-century city. That the fiscal crisis brought to a um, kind of, it, 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 it transformed the city's government and opened up a new era for New York, one in which the city would become more unequal than it had been in the post-war era. And for, I think for a museum dedicated to financial history, the history of the fiscal crisis also points to another set of questions. This is an episode that can instruct us in the ways that financial instruments are connected to social policy. It can be easy at times, I think, to forget that something like the humble municipal bond actually both makes possible a whole range of city functions and that disruptions in these kinds of financial relationships have a marked impact on the lives of citizens. The fiscal crisis marked a moment when the power of creditors and the increasing reliance of the city of short-term debt were used to bring about a set of fundamental political shifts in the city. So just to, find, to, to conclude, in my book, I suggest that this austerity was a political choice, that it reflected a particular interpretation of events, one that ultimately benefited some people and not others. And I suggest that many people resisted the transformation of the city that was occurring at that time. And uh, the way that they talked about finance is kind of interesting in its own right. So to understand the crisis, to pull back for a moment, it's important, I think, to recognize, first of all, the distinctive social vision that predominated in New York in the middle years of the 20th century. One of the things that was very interesting to me in working on the book was exploring the breadth of the city's government at this moment. So just to briefly run down, during these years, New York ran a network of more than 20 municipal hospitals and many more primary care clinics. It had an ambitious public health department that conducted its own research into many questions of public health. 
It operated, obviously, the largest transit system in the country um, and was very committed to uh, holding the fare down. Federal spending during the New Deal years ushered in a wave of public projects, parks, swimming pools, roads. And during the 1960s, in the war on poverty years, the city expanded its social spending still more, opening daycares, funding welfare, sponsoring clinics, helping people addicted to drugs. Tuition at CUNY was free, and the system expanded dramatically over the post-war years, with several of the, 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 the um, the, the uh, new four-year colleges added, as well as the network of two-year schools. I wouldn't romanticize this social order. It was unequal in many ways, even at the height of the post-war years. But there is a way in which I think New York in the mid-20th century embodies a vision of city life in terms of social rights in which a belonging to an urban community gave you access to certain forms of material support, and that this promoted a particular kind of democratic culture within the city. Now, the city's fiscal crisis had deep roots. It did not emerge suddenly in 1975. In 1963-64, for example, there are already the be begin to be dramatic imbalances in, between the city's revenues and its debts. Um, the city's revenues in 1963-64, for example, were 3.3 billion, and its gross debt was about 7 billion, the vast majority of this being long-term debt. This ratio improves later in the 1960s, but the difficulties the city is beginning to have covering its expenses do not go away, and by 1974-75, its revenues were about $12 billion and its debt about $14 billion, with about $5 billion at that point in short-term debt. Banks had been willing to tolerate, and the, the municipal bond market was able to tolerate the high debt load of the early 60s, but by the 70s, the city lost its access to the credit markets. Why was this? Well, my argument in Fear City differs from a lot of the existing literature in that I don't place the, the blame on excessive spending by the city. New York's public workforce was not paid out of line with other city workforces. The city was much larger, and it took on a great deal more but it was responding to real social needs. Um, I would say first, the fiscal crisis happened in the 1970s because the city was mired in recession, recession that affected the whole country, but affected New York especially sharply. And actually here, just uh, one, this is a, an image of, that gives some sense of what's starting to happen to New York in the early 1970s. This is the, the West Side Highway, which actually collapsed at, um, in, kind of in, around uh, West 12th Street, um, in 1973. Interestingly, it collapsed right when repairs were beginning on the road. Um, a asphalt truck carrying uh, material to begin a massive to begin a renovation was too heavy and simply crashed through the road, falling to the, the street below and causing the West Side Highway, or the elevated portion of it, um, which it was elevated at this point that time downtown, to be shut for several years. Um, and I think this gives a sense of the, the, the poor condition to which the city is falling in the early 1970s. 